Hello everyone and welcome to SeedWorld Strategy Webinar. Today we'll be sharing tips and information you can use to effectively communicate the value of seed treatments to your customers. My name is Sean Brook. I'm the President of SeedWorld Media and today I'm going to be serving as your moderator, so welcome. First and very importantly, I would like to thank our sponsors, BASF, Bearcraft Science, and Syngenta for their support. Without them, this doesn't happen. A few housekeeping items to note. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on SeedWorld.com following the event. For audio quality purposes, all microphones have been muted with the exception of our speakers today. If you have a question or comment, please make sure to share them in the chat box on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, and I'll make a note of them and make sure to get those questions to our speakers. Today we are joined by four speakers uh, to talk about communicating the value of seed applied technologies to our customers. Um, we are joined by Kerry Grossweiler from Bear Seed Growth, Pella Peterson from Syngenta, Justin Clark from BASF, and Mr. Scott Downey from Purdue University. Welcome gentlemen and thanks for joining us today. A quick recap on how things are going to go. First we're going to hear from Carrie on the benefits and value of seed treatments. Following that we'll hear from Pella on using seed treatments for risk management. We'll then hear from Justin about the role seed coatings and colorants play in the total seed treatment package. And finally, we'll wrap up with Scott on ways to communicate those, the value of those seed treatments clearly and quantifiably to our customers. So let's go ahead and get started. Kerry Grossweiler is the Bear Seed Growth Equipment and Coatings Manager, uh, originally from Illinois and graduated from Illinois State University. Go Redbirds! Kerry has <laughs> been with Bayer since 2004 and has extensive experience with farm applied, downstream, and commercial seed treatments, as well as supply chain management. Kerry has been involved in the launch of several successful uh, new tre seed treatment products for Bayer, such as Trilex, Vortex, Poncho Beta, Poncho Vativo, On Demand Seed Treatment System, Fluency Agent, and Olivo. And I will now turn it over to you, Kerry. Well, thank you, Sean, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to talk about the value of seed applied technologies. Communicating the value of seed applied technology is about understanding customer needs. Growers know the disease and pest pressure on their farms and area and are looking for solutions. It's important that experts share information on the available, available tools with growers to continue productivity increases that have defined modern agriculture. My presentation includes information on the benefits of seed treatments for the farmer, success factors for a high quality seed treatment, bare seed growth, and examples of value creation using seed treatments for both corn and soybeans. The benefits of seed treatments for the farmer start with choosing a seed treatment that not only protects the seed investment, but provides the opportunity for the seed to reach its maximum yield potential. Convenience is having product on the seed at planting time that saves both labor and time to apply. Seed treatments provide targeted application for protection against insects nematodes and diseases, including sudden death syndrome. And remember, there's no rescue treatment for below ground pests. Seed treatments utilize low use rates. The application rates per acre are very low compared to in-furrow and foliar alternatives. And seed treatment uh, field research, not only by manufacturers, but universities and growers have shown consistent higher yields for proven return on investment. The first thing that comes to mind in seed treatment quality is appearance. And really what you're seeing is, is the colorant. Is it uniform and consistent on the seed? But colorant is just one component of a seed treatment system that could contain one or multiple of a seed applied fungicides, 
feed applied insecticide and coatings. I'd like to really back up for a moment, talk about the work that goes into the formulation of a seed treatment. Is it concentrated? Today's seed treatment application rates are one to two fluid ounces per hundred weight of seed. Is it compatible with other seed treatments? Some seed treatments, when mixed together, uh, begin to gel or cause application issues. Is it safe on the seed? Seed companies, basic manufacturers, uh, spend a lot of time looking at multiple tests of seed and seed treatments to make sure that when new varieties are brought to the marketplace that seed treatments aren't impacting emergence or the overall yield potential. Another item is application equipment. And I first want to speak about commercial equipment because Bayer has developed uh, a CBT, a continuous batch treater, over 10 years ago. And, and this next fact always just amazes me that a CBT is able to apply 1.25 milligram active ingredient of poncho and 10 million spores of Otivo on each and every corn seed. And for downstream treating at either a retailer or a seed dealer, Bayer developed the on-demand system. It's a closed system and fully automated for safety to treat seeds correctly and consistently. On-demand is software that calculates application to the seed based upon product weight loss through a system of scales. On-demand monitors pump rates into a neat application through a preloaded recipe. At the touch of a button, you can select preloaded recipes for disease, insect, nematode, or SDS protection. Preloaded recipes save time by eliminating mixing slurries and the potential mistakes in making those slurries. Bear seed growth has four competencies, products, equipment, coatings, and services. I talked about products and equipment on the previous slide. I'd like to make a comment about coatings because coatings have been developed not only for active ingredient retention on the seed, limit dust off during planting, and most importantly, provide plantability to prevent skips and doubles utilized in today's planting equipment. So we're really proud of Bayer to provide integrated on-seed solutions through Bayer Seed Growth. But how about the economics? What does the seed treatment cost and what can I expect for my return on investment? The example here is the value creation of using Ponchovotivo on corn. And just a quick grounding on Ponchovotivo, Poncho moves systemically within the plant to protect against above and below ground insects, and Votivo creates a living barrier that grows with the roots to extend protection through multiple generations of nematodes. Also, Ponchovotivo contains a bacteria that provides early season plant growth. The average cost, or I'm sorry, the average increase with Ponchovotivo is 10 bushels per acre. Over corn treated with a standard fungicide system. In this example, you'll see uh, the first row and two columns, and both those columns show that yield gain of 10 bushels and the second row shows corn price at first $3 a bushel and then the second column $3.50 a bushel. So using 10 bushels times that corn price equals a benefit per acre of $30 or $35 per acre. And assuming a grower cost per acre of $6 and that's uh, using a seed treatment cost at $15 per corn seed unit, and a corn seed unit plants two and a half acres, 
So $15 divided by two and a half would equal your $6 per acre cost. And benefit divided by cost would equal a return on investment of five to one or six to one based on the different commodity prices shown here of $3 or $3.50 a bushel. The next example is showing value creation in soybeans utilizing Poncho Tivo and Olivo. And in the previous slide, I already talked about uh, Poncho Tivo as a product, but let me just mention Olivo as a new seed treatment for soybean sudden death syndrome, as well as having activity against nematodes in the seed zone. With an average increase of eight to 10 bushels per acre with Ponchovotivo and Olivo, including a base fungicide system when compared to untreated soybeans in fields that have visual symptoms of sudden death syndrome. So the first row has two columns with first a yield gain of eight bushels and the second column showing a yield gain of 10 bushels as an example. The commodity price stays the same in both at $9, creating a grower benefit per acre of $72 or $90. An estimated grower cost per acre is $30 for both seed applied fungicide, Ponchovotivo, Olivo, coating and coloring, and application. Benefit divided by the cost equals a return on investment of 2.4 to 1 or 3 to 1 based on that yield gain of 8 or 10 bushels. So in summary, growers must decide whether or not the use of a seed treatment is needed balanced against the potential economic loss if a seed treatment is not used. Seed applied technologies provide growers benefits with respect to safety and provide plant health. Seed treatments allow growers to choose the right variety for their area, plant wind conditions are right, and maximize yield and profitability. I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And now I'll turn it back to Sean. Thanks, Kerry. If anyone has any questions about Kerry's presentation, please feel free to type them into the chat box that you'll see on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, and we will make sure that uh, Kerry gets a chance to answer them at the end of our session. Now we are, uh, we'll move over to Pella Peterson, and he, he was named head of Seed Care Product Marketing in March of 2015. He joined Syngenta in 2010 and has held a variety of roles on the Syngenta Seed Care technical team, including heading up the Seed Care R&D and the Seed Care Institute in Stanton, Minnesota. Prior to Syngenta, Pella was an associate professor at Iowa State University, where he coordinated and provided state leadership in soybean production and management, splitting his time between extension work and research. He received his doctorate in agronomy and plot pathology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, Pella, Pella, it is all yours, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, uh, Sean, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So um, this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the value of seed applied technologies. And um, Syngenta have been in the seed treatment business for more than 35 years. The business has changed a lot, and uh, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody listening out there that the way we looked at seed treatment 35 years ago to compare to today has been, uh, has been quite different. Uh, growers are seeing the value. They are adapting uh, very quickly. And the intensive intensification that we're seeing in the market from the, from the uh, experiences that the growers are seeing out there uh, is probably just to the beginning where we expect it's going to go in the future. So Genta is very committed to the seed treatment business. Uh, today, uh, we have a very strong R&D pipeline coming in the near future. Um, as many of you probably know, uh, we are investing this year $1.4 billion uh, just in Syngenta all in R&D, and uh, we are very uh, dedicated to the seed treatment business. In addition to, to products, we are also investing a lot in infrastructure, 
And many of you have heard that we are currently is in progress of expanding our CK Institute in Stanton, Minnesota with additional 38,000 square foot for training and support of our, of our business. So the value of seed treatments. There's always a lot of discussion about uh, protection against different insects, diseases, and nematodes out there. But in many cases, the discussion around why growers really use the seed treatment is a lot of time is, is, is forgotten. But what's laying, laying behind this is that the value of seed treatment is, is of course, it's all about yield in, 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 the, in, in this situation here. But also, there are some very traditional economic things that we, it's very important that we highlight. First of all, uh, the value of the seed treatment that really help in uniform emergence and, and improve stand establishment, uh, the minimizing the risk of replanting and protecting that genetic yield potential that we know our seeds are, are bringing with it. It offers early planting benefits to most row crops, and as you know, early planting is very critical to maximize yields for most of our crop. And because of that, any kind of replanting will first of all give the growers an additional seed cost but it will also put them in a scenario that they will have to plant later, and when they're doing that, they will get a lower yield potential. And then finally, it will produce consistently higher yield. It will deliver early season insects, disease, and nematode protection uh, to the growers from that perspective. Another thing that is also critical is uh, the whole thing about the root health and root protection. Not many technologies are available to growers today to help in that, that root system. Uh, to get maximum yields, uh, we know we have a genetic yield potential. It's all about root health and root protection. And this is a lot of times for, for, forgot, and it's very important that we bring in that into, into the discussion here today. When we're using our broad spectrum uh, seed treatments uh, in the market, a lot of times we will use seed treatments that will go, both give protection against uh, seedling diseases, uh, soil-borne pathogens like Rhizoctonia, Pethium, and Fusarium. It would also give us protection against insects below ground like wireworm and white grubs that we cannot manage um, in any other ways than with seed treatments. Um, there are some granule in for insecticides that are available to manage some of these below ground insects, but the efficacy compared to the seed treatments um, are, are not as good. Of course, there are the nematodes that are in a new area that uh, we are working on. And then, of course, there's the abiotic stresses, so uh, dealing both with drought, cold, uh, drought stress and cold stress, and then, of course, uh, nutrients uh, uptake. Uh, many of these uh, seed treatment has some additional benefits that, that will help in this area as well. So, um, as you just heard from Carrie, I'm, I am also going to give uh, some uh, different examples. I'm going to give six different examples on these uh, agronomic benefits that these seed treatments will bring to us and uh, how they work uh, from a risk management perspective. First, I'm going to give two examples from risk management, both the one talking about the value on the return on investment from the growers uh, when we're using our fungicide insecticide seed treatments. Um, I'm also going to talk about replanting and some of the scenarios that we're dealing with with crop insurance and, and when, we are, when, we are, when we have to make the decision if we're going to replant or not. I'm going to talk about some of these below grower insects that are very difficult to manage without a seed treatment. And then I'm going to talk about above ground insects. I'll give an example from, uh, from aphids. I've also been talking about some of these vigor effects and some of these benefits that some of our seed treatments can give the plants because of uniform emergence and, and, uh, and, and higher stand establishment. And then last, I'm going to give two examples on how uh, our seed treatments now can help the breeders enhancing the performance of the native trade resistance where we start seeing performing issues because of um, too many years of using the same source of resistance. Um, so let's jump into it. First, I want to talk about is, uh, the risk management tools, and, and I pulled out from the scientific literature here two uh, different studies. Uh, to the left uh, of, the, of the slide here, you can see, uh, you can see the, um, the, the example from a paper that was published in 2012 from uh, Paul Eastgren and Sean Conley at the University of Wisconsin. Um, it was a study that was done across three years. Uh, they tested uh, the seed treatments at nine locations per year, so a total of 27 site sites. 
Um, their conclusion was that the seed tubings will be a very great cost-effective component of soybean production. And just as an example from one of the, the tables in there, I just pulled out uh, where we are today at around $9 a bushel soybeans. Uh, they saw a 93% probability of break-even um, with an average yield of around 60 bushel that most of our growers are dealing with today using um, a seed treatment like Cruiser Max beans that will have both a fungicide and insecticide. So a very, very high probability that really helps the growers in this case here go out and, and plant early to maximize yield and the, the risk of, of losing money is, uh, is very close to zero. The other example you see to the right was a study that was uh, also conducted in Wisconsin by Gaspar et al published back in 2015 in Crop Science, where they tested different seed treatments at nine locations per year, so a total of 18 site years. And in here, uh, the conclusion was that they saw a highly significant yield benefit of using fungicide insecticide. They saw a significantly lower risk. Uh, they saw an increased profit at both reduced and recommending seeding rates, meaning that the risk of they had to replant when you used a seed treatment versus not a seed treatment was significantly lower. So uh, significantly uh, benefits in this scenario here. So here are just two examples on uh, how seed treatments are being used uh, that um, is new for growers that use them for, for risk management tools. Next slide I want to talk to you about is a little bit related to um, the below ground insects. Kerry talked a little bit about the, uh, the risk uh, associated with, um, with dealing with these below ground uh, insects and diseases. Um, the majority of them do not have uh, any what I call a rescue treatment. So what it means here is when you go out and buy a high value seed uh, that is uh, high yielding, um, when you are planting it, uh, there's nothing you can do to fix some of these below ground insects. And that's one of the discussions that have been out there uh, for a long time. And, and not to go give you a lot of data, we just went through some data. You're going to see more data later. But here's just a perfect example from Washington, the state of Washington, where we see the value of using a, a seed treatment insecticide in a wireworm uh, environment. And um, it is a big problem. A wireworm is a very common insect that we see throughout North America and uh, particularly like, like a lot of these old prairie soils, but you can find them everywhere. And um, we, we didn't really see the big damage from these wireworms until we start uh, really getting into this whole uh, trait um, using GM traits. Uh, when we did that back in the mid-90s uh, where farmers started adopting the GM traits, a lot of farmers went away from using uh, granule and liquid insecticide in furrow. And uh, the reason for that was that uh, the traits uh, helped them with all of that, uh, with all the insect protection. But what it did was that that granule insecticide and liquid insecticide also have efficacy on other insects in the soil. And one of the insects that really went to the top was wireworm and, 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 and grubs and sea corp maggot, because many of the GM traits do not have efficacy on those. So great example where uh, changes in technologies farmers are adopting. Uh, a lot of times um, we will open a gap behind us and a great example where seed treatment fit very well in to help protect that. Another area also that seed treatment uh, has been a big benefit on is uh, on, on aphids. And I will just give here one example uh, for soybean aphids. Most seed treatments that we're using today will give an early season protection uh, for around um, most cases up to 30 days. Uh, but some of these uh, sap feeders, like aphids, a lot of time the efficacy can be longer. And for Cruiser Max beans, we have seen up to uh, 60 days protection, uh, depending on the environmental conditions um, on soybean aphid. And what that gives you, in that scenario, what that will do is it will be a great tool to help you managing soybean aphids, because a lot of time, as you know, these seed treatments are very uh, specific to these uh, insects. So beneficial insects that you have in the fields, uh, if they're not feeding on the soybean plant, they will not be influenced and impacted by, by the seed treatments. So if you have uh, efficacy on soybean aphids, and you can see that here, um, there are three bars. To the left, you can see there was a 14% of the trials that was no efficacy on the soybean aphids. Um, and this is just a traditional natural um, um, experimental error. 
um, in the middle you see 37% of the fields where it will delay our fully application of aphids uh, by one to three weeks, and then to the right you see uh, nearly 49% of the fields uh, did not uh, need a foliar spray even though soybean aphids was present in the field. And this was done across six years at 35 trials. But this, what this really tells us and shows is that a lot of times these seed treatments, they are a perfect IPM tool because they help protect the beneficials you have within the field. They have a very specific target on the insects. So you can use the seed treatment, you can get suppression on these soybean aphids, and in many cases then the beneficial will be able to hold the numbers below uh, the specific threshold within the field. And in this case here, in 49% of the cases, no Foley application was needed. Another example with these seed applied insecticide and another example for, from, from soybean is that a lot of time also a lot of positive benefits um, uh, in addition to, to insect protection. And the reason is back is related to some of these, uh, the uniform emergence. And then in, in the case with Cruiser Max Beans, uh, we have patented the Vigor effect with Cruiser. We see a very uniform and rapid growth during the establishment phase. And a lot of times we will pick up yield benefits of that. But one of the mistakes that we a lot of time do in research is most of uh, our research equipment are set up to uh, only do uh, small plot research, so 10 by, 10 by um, 25 feet. And in many cases, you get edge effect. So for you to show the really value, you need to put these plots out in larger blocks to be able to show the, the true benefits. And here's a perfect, ex perfect example where the two bars to the left, you can see are treated with Cruiser Max beans, fungicide insecticide. To the right, they're non-treated. And you can see there's a five and a half bushel yield difference between them when you go from the, from the interior part of the blocks. But if you do at the edge, it's only 1.9 bushel. So to show the true value, in many cases, you're going to have to work with larger plots to really look at that. In the end, I'm going to show you two examples on uh, how uh, seed treatments are helping enhancing resistant varieties. The first example, and something is very, we are very happy about, is related to uh, uh, soybean cyst nematode and Clariva complete beans. Uh, we have used the same source of resistant PI88788 for more than 25 years, and we not start seeing performance issues with it. So the only way for us to really enhance the performance in resist of resistant varieties is to using a seed applied nematicide like Clariva complete beans. And we have seen 4.6% uh, around 2.5 bushel yield advantage uh, using this technology. Another example I'm going to show you is from sunflower dealing with downy mildew, where downy mildew is one of the toughest diseases we're dealing with. Uh, it's causing a lot of troubles. Uh, most of our host resistance are, um, are creating resistance to this very quickly. And here's a perfect example where you can see our seed treatments. In this case here, I have an experimental seed treatment really help enhancing the performance of the uh, virulent strains of downy mildew in the field uh, to, maximize, uh, to maximize performance on that. So to wrap it up in the summary, seed treatment are target application using low use rates and applied where needed and, and fit very well into an IPM strategies. Seed treatments protect the germinating seed and the seeding during the critical first two to five weeks of the youth development, setting all sorts of same mechanisms in the seed right. Seed treatments fit very well into modern agriculture by helping farmers to protect the genetic yield potential and utilize economic practices to maximize yield and profitability. Seed treatments are critical for below ground insects since rescue treatments aren't possible and the establishment phase is critical to plant vitality and for maximizing yield potential. And then last seed treatments are just excellent tools to help to enhance the performance of the resistant varieties. So by that, I will hand it back over to Sean. Uh, thank you so much for participating in this and I'll be happy to address any question uh, after the last two presenters. Thank you, Pella. I, as uh, Paula just said, I remind everyone that if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them into the uh, chat box on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. We'll address them at the end of the session. Now we will move on to uh, Justin Clark, who serves as a seed treatment technical market specialist for BASF crop protection. As a member of the technical marketing team, Justin supports field research efforts and manages technical positioning, training, and product use recommendations for BASF seed treatment and seed enhancement products. It is your turn, Justin. 
Thanks, Sean. And thanks to everybody for joining in on today's Seed World webinar. And really thanks to Seed World for inviting BSF to discuss uh, what we think is a very important part of our business. And so I'll be covering really the importance of colorants and seed coatings uh, in today's seed treatment business uh, around the world. At BSF, we really take a holistic approach to seed enhancements and provide a complete or oftentimes custom on-seed solution for growers and many channel partners. We're able to do this uh, and offer a broad portfolio of solutions on seed that deliver enhanced appearance, active ingredient retention, seed flow ability, disease control, and ultimately yield at the end of the day. We really feel our expertise and background uh, around functional coatings and these colors uh, blended with biologicals and traditional AIs allow us to really know how each product works together to deliver increased performance for, the, for our channel partners and also field performance at the end of the day for growers. And I think one of the, one of the biggest things with the recent acquisition of Becker Underwood, this really allows us uh, to expand our knowledge on biological compatibility uh, with on-seed inoculants and also biologicals in a very complex or in very complex formulations. A broad portfolio of advanced seed enhancements cover most seed treatment applications and stakeholder needs. As you can see from a product uh, portfolio breakdown, we have uh, several different products for uh, enhanced appearance, things like our common color coat line of products and also seed gloss, seed gloss products that provide that enhanced appearance and often luster. Uh, and if dust management is concerned for stakeholders, we offer things like secure or CF clear coatings for uh, most uh, row crops. And to really address all the above seed coating concerns, we offer flow rot and separate line of products to provide that increased appearance and active ingredient retention while also delivering uh, flowability and increased plantability. Here from just a quick breakdown of the products that we have as far as colorants go are common things like color coats, custom colors where we work with many customers and develop something specifically for their needs. Also seed gloss, you can see from the uh, photos at the bottom, uh, the glossy appearance that seed gloss brings and many seed treaters and customers really prefer that to really uh, provide that showy uh, seed for the customers. I'm moving in from colorants to seed coatings and how we see uh, the market of seed coatings from where it started at, where it is today, and BSF's approach for the future. The first development of seed coatings really based around that adhesion of that active ingredient on the seed and also provide some additional cosmetics, uh, but also retain that active ingredient and prevent dust off. That's kind of where we've been as an industry. Here at BSF, we've expanded on that by providing an all-in-one formulation that also provides that uh, additional seed flow and plantability. Moving forward, we're optimizing how these coatings interact with many components going into different uh, and various treatment formulations. What we'll really view for the next frontier in coatings technology is based around delivering some of these additional plant health and agronomic benefits with these coatings applications. Briefly touched on it, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into our flow route line of functional seed coatings. They're advanced polymer-based technology that combines adhesion and retention of, the, of active ingredient, as well as exceptional seed flow. And these are compatible with most major fungicides, insecticides, nematicides, inoculants, and also colorants on the market. So really taking uh, a broad view of how to develop these things. Also, they're water-based, uh, pH neutral, low viscosity, and washable. 
One of our new developments for 2016 that we're very proud of, we've been working on for a few years, is Flow Route 3330. And you can see several developments that we've had over the years, one being that industry-leading Flow Route 1197 that many seed companies uh, rely on today. It's kind of been the gold standard for corn uh, as a corn seed polymer. You can see with the addition, or the addition of Flow Route 3330, we're reducing that level of dust off on seed. And you can see that from the Hoibach filter paper disk uh, visually there on the right side. So we've talked about AI retention. What does that really mean for planning accuracy? Uh, because we do call these things oftentimes plantability polymers. We're looking at corn seed treated with a common uh, neonic seed treatment and either no polymer or uh, our flow route polymer. You can see we greatly reduce the amount of skips and doubles during the planning process. And this really matters because Think about corn, we know that final yield in corn is driven by plant, stand, <coughs> plant stands. And so the reduction of skips and doubles will translate ultimately uh, more uh, evenly distributed stands. <coughs> so in a study published a few years ago, it was found that a grower is able to realize the greatest yield potential when plants are within two to three inches a perfect seed spacing. So this study concluded you lose approximately uh, two bushels per acre for every inch increase in deviation from perfect spacing. So this could result uh, in 14 bushels per acre lost when stands deviate by eight inches from proper spacing. So this research really shows the importance of that plantability aspect and reducing those skips and doubles by using the plantability polymer. <clears throat> With this, I provided a quick flowability uh, video today that shows how we evaluate seed flow and plantability in our, aim, or in our lab here in Ames, Iowa. If we can get this video started <clears throat> really quickly. This is looking at flow route uh, 1706 on soybean. So our seed flow procedure, we take a set amount of seed and put it through our uh, Nicholas flow funnel, and then turn the flow funnel on for a set amount of time to measure seed flow with different treatments that we're testing. In this example, we're going to run the flow meter for 60 seconds. And we're going to look at two different treatments. The treatment on the left, of test number one, is just water and a common neonic insecticide applied to soybeans. The treatment on the right is the same uh, neonic insecticide with our flow route 1706. And as you can begin to see, the time elapses. There's more seed. In the treatment on the right, we can see more seed flow on the right. Flow route 1706 and other flow routes act as a thin film coating, basically reduces friction from seed to seed, and increases uh, seed flow by providing that smooth, even surface over the top of other treatments. You can see same treatments, only difference is treatment on the route has flow route 1706 applied to it. Stop it after 60 seconds, and then we measure the total volume of seed within that, or in this instance, height. And you can see flow route 1706 was able to increase uh, the amount of soybean flow by 41%. Think of this in terms on a grower's operation or a seed treater's operation. It's able to increase that throughput, but also on a grower's operation, able to increase that seed placement, which we know uh, will ultimately, ultimately translate uh, to yield at the end of the day. So 
And in closing, I just want to highlight our advanced seed enhancement portfolio helps growers get the most out of every acre by one, increasing their efficiency through increased planning efficiency and also accuracy. But also we're helping them reduce their risk by maintaining active ingredients on the seed and keeping them where they belong. We're giving growers and channel partners more peace of mind. And at the end of the day, what it's all about is to maximize that yield through seed and seedling protection and get those stands started early. With that, I want to say thank you uh, to Seed World again for inviting us to speak about colors and seed coatings today. Thank you, Justin. And again, a reminder, uh, questions, bottom left-hand corner, we'll capture them all and, uh, and give the guys a chance to answer them at the end of the session. Now we will move on to uh, Scott Downey, Associate Professor of Ag Economics from Purdue University. As an assistant professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics, Scott teaches courses in sales and marketing, and he's a coordinator of the sales and marketing degree program. He joined Purdue University on a full-time basis in 2000 after spending 15 years in the financial services industry. He is the lead author of Pro Selling, a professional approach to selling in agriculture and other industries. Scott is also an associate director of the Center for Food and Agricultural Business. He teaches in many of the center's programs and is frequent speaker and consultant for agribusiness industry sales teams on professional development topics such as precision selling, sales management, and competitive sales strategies. The discovery process he created has been adopted by Fortune 300 companies and he's presented all over the world. I will now turn it over to my Boilermaker friend, Scott. Thank you very much, Sean, and uh, I apologize everybody for the long intro. I've only got a few minutes here and that took uh, most of it, so I'll just say thank you for your, uh, this opportunity uh, and have a great day. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, so it's great to be with you today and I really appreciate um, hearing from uh, each of the three prior speakers. Uh, I want to talk just a little bit today about um, how we communicate the value of seed applied technologies and each of our speakers um, rightly brought that into uh, their discussions as well. Uh, I heard from uh, Carrie talking about uh, how preloaded recipes save time and I heard from Pello words like yield risk, break even profit, uh, and Justin and I learned about skips and doubles and how those uh, translate uh, to evenly distributed stands. E each one of those uh, presentations I think did a great job of talking not only about the value of those technologies but some of the ways that we apply them uh, in our communication. And I think that's a, it's a pretty important part of what we do. Uh, if you think about how we communicate uh, you identify that we really have two tools that we use uh, to share the value of our uh, coatings and seed applied technologies. One of those is a marketing approach uh, where we spend time talking to others, uh, but our focus in marketing is really to identify those pieces of our value proposition that relate to as many customers as possible. Our second tool is sales. And our role in sales is also to identify those lists of benefits, but really to identify what's going to appeal to that individual customer. And I want to spend a little time today talking about how those are different because uh, while in each case we're identifying benefits that appeal to customers, they're really different activities. As marketers, we're trying to uh, arouse attention, gain interest, uh, get people to want to buy it, and ultimately to take the action of buying. We're doing the exact same things in selling. We've got to get their attention, get a customer's attention, get their interest, create some desire and get them to take the action of buying, but we have the opportunity when we sell of creating individualized attention and interest. And that's what makes the sales process for these 
so unique is that we have the ability to communicate value uniquely to each person that we're talking to. And, and our interests of each person are very different. So oftentimes when we think about value, we think about value as this relationship between what somebody pays, the cost, uh, and cost is broader than that, of course. It's also how much risk they take and how much headache they're willing to go through and how much time it takes. Uh, but, and we look at how much they pay for it and then how much they get as a result of it. So buyers, when they look at value, they're making these trade-offs between what they get and what they have to get up, give up to get it. And uh, Carrie did that in dollars and cents for us and said, look, uh, the payoff for this is uh, five to one or six to one making assumptions. Each one of our speakers brought some I recognition of what those benefits are and often talked about the costs and what that relationship is. What we find through our research is that there are really three types of buyers. Some buyers primarily focus on cost. Some buyers primarily focus on the benefits that they receive. And other buyers are able to make a more complex comparison between the two. And those are three really different ways of viewing value. If I am trying to communicate my value, I have to be clear about which way my individual buyer in a sales process is viewing this, uh, these relationships. So if they're viewing primarily cost, then I want to show how perhaps um, my technology could save them money if I can, but save them time perhaps. If my buyer is primarily focused on benefits, I may want to connect that to yield. And if my customer is focused on value, I may really want to take this down to an ROI. Those are three really different conversations. So the way I communicate value has to depend on the type of buyer I'm interacting with in a sales role. Now, I, I wish it were just that easy and we could say, all right, uh, what is the, um, uh, what, how do I know what type of buyer I'm dealing with? And I think most salespeople are adept enough to recognize that the way I do that is through the questioning process. And, and over time, I, I build a pattern of what kinds of questions that particular customer asks me. Do they primarily ask me about costs? Uh, do they primarily ask me about uh, agronomic benefits or standability or plant health or, or yields? Or do they really look at that, uh, how things are going to affect the profit number, their bottom line? Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as just identifying those three things because buyers don't make their buying decisions on the basis of any of those three things. They don't make buying decisions on costs, even though I just told you that they did. They don't make buying decisions on benefits, and they don't make buying decisions on value. What they make their buying decisions on more accurately are their perceptions of those three things. So our role when we're communicating the value of seed applied technologies is to shape those perceptions. That leaves us with a real dilemma. What perceptions am I trying to appeal to? So we look at those perceptions that we're trying to appeal to and say, okay, well, what kind of customer is this and what do they care about most? No buyer makes a decision on product. In order to receive the value that we just heard our three speakers talk about, somebody will have already had to have made a buying decision. Therefore, the decision they're making is based on their perceptions. And we have a unique circumstance right now where many farmers are shaping their perceptions heavily around economics. And so often our tendency is to want to say that 
using a technology will produce a higher yield or increase disease resistance. But those don't communicate value. What those communicate are benefits. What we want to try to do today is heavily invest in a conversation around economic terms. Well, of course, higher yields are going to produce better economics, and, and increased disease resistance is going to produce better economics. We would say, of course. The challenge is, if we go back to these benefits here, and we look at how uh, the benefits are viewed, the economics are not viewed in dollars, typically. What we see is that costs are very clearly in dollars. So when we move to perceptions, it's very easy to view the perceptions of costs in economic terms, because somebody's got to write a check for that. It's much more difficult for people to make the conversion in their mind that yield or disease resistance turn into real dollar benefits. So my message today is that if we want to communicate economic value, we have to be able to help our customers see the economic value of the purchase. But it's not just any economic value of the purchase. We have to create that economic value about in any way that they view as meaningful. So for some buyers, they're going to be looking at agronomic benefits. That's going to be their primary driver, in which case what my job is if I'm communicating value is to take those agronomic benefits, how this uh, product will result in stronger, better growth, and translate that into economic value. If I just jump straight to the dollar value, the ROI, and I don't mention agronomics, I won't have appealed to them. Similarly, there's some who really focus around the environmental benefits. How does, this in, how, does, uh, how does this give me an opportunity for fewer passes? Or uh, how does this help me be more sustainable? And then I take that soil compaction or that sustainable practice and I turn that into an economic benefit. Or what does this mean for me in, in terms of uh, machinery performance? If I'm able to take uh, that coating and, I'm, and because it's got less dust on it, I'm going to have fewer breakdowns, and those fewer breakdowns cost me money, how am I going to turn those? What, what does that mean in terms of dollars? We think people in their heads will say, oh, yeah, I see. Less dust means fewer breakdowns. Fewer breakdowns means uh, I can uh, use my time better or, or ultimately save money. Great except that they don't. They don't translate that into dollars, so our job is to help them. And then even those who are economically focused, our, our opportunity there is to really show what the impact of having those additional dollars is going to be on their farm. So what we see here is that when uh, economics are driving much of the decision making, our job is uh, to connect to all of those. And then uh, finally, uh, my, the, what I would suggest to you is that our, the best way to do this is to ask our customers think, to think themselves and to make the calculations themselves about how benefits turn into dollar value. I can tell them that th those things, but that doesn't have as big of an impact on them as if they calculate it themselves. So regardless of the way that they perceive value, whether they focus on benefits, they focus on cost, they focus on value, uh, or they're most interested in the agronomic side of things, or the environmental side of things, or the efficiency, or economics, my task is to communicate in the way that they'd like to be communicated with and to help them justify the decisions they would like to make by, by helping them s create the perceptions of the economic value of the decisions they're looking at. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sean, and of course, I'll be glad to answer any questions as well. 
Thank you very much, sir. Gentlemen, great job. I uh, think you all did a fantastic job of your presentations. I want to run through some questions. Uh, we are pretty committed to staying on our time, so any questions that we don't get to, we're going to capture, share with our speakers, collect their answers, and then that will all be available on SeedWorld.com as well. So I, I'm going to start off with one that I think hits, uh, hits a lot of folks who sell seed. And the question is, what are the most common objections that a retailer might face when he's selling seed treatments, and, and how would you respond? What ammunition would you give him to put into his gun, so to speak? Can I, one of you gentlemen jump in on that? This is Scott. I'll jump in quickly. Uh, just I know we're on a tight time frame. I, I, I think uh, price is, op, op, uh, uh, is frequently one of the objections that we get the most. Uh, and um, I, I think that's the, that's the cost objection that, that I just talked about. And I think the best way to deal with a price objection is first to acknowledge uh, the difficult predicament that people are in and, and acknowledge that that's a legitimate concern today. We are talking about spending additional funds uh, for these types of activities. Uh, but I, I think that every decision a farmer makes today uh, is uh, using a technology that if we look back over time, we once didn't have. And so if we remind that the decisions we're making on the farm today are not just expenses, but they have a return, and then can help them see the value of that return and recognize that a cost objection is actually a value objection, then I think we're able to be able to to more clearly uh, communicate our value. Excellent. Thanks, Scott. Um, I'm also going to give each of these gentlemen an opportunity to answer that question as well, and that will again be captured and put up onto the website. Harry, question for you. Um, what stewardship best management practices would you recommend to retailers that, that they pass on to their farmer customers as far as seed treatment products? Yes, that's a great question, Sean. And you know, we really have a uh, program called CARE uh, that's all about stewardship and communication between uh, growers and beekeepers. And it's really about beekeepers letting uh, growers know where their beehives are located at. And it's also about growers sharing uh, their planting activities with their beekeepers. Uh, it's really C for communication. Uh, A, then it's making sure growers are aware of wind speed and direction during planting. And the R is really about reducing risk. And Bayer has a product called Fluency Agent, which is a planter seed lubricant for corn and soybeans uh, that reduces that dust that's released during the planting process and then uh, would reduce overall risk um, to uh, foraging honeybees and other pollinators that might come in contact with that dust. And E is just really ensuring seeds planted correctly. Great. Thank you, sir. Um, we, we are bumping right up against our time, and I apologize to everyone who submitted a lot of great questions. They will come to the guys, and they will offer their answers to them. One thing to look for, though, is there's a lot of questions about neonics and the, the, the pressure or fire that that has come under over the last little while. So we're going to give these guys a great opportunity to share their take on what that means for the industry and how that will impact the industry in the future. So that will be a big one to be able to look for on the website, and the guys will be able to practice their answer a little bit on that one. I won't put them on the spot right this second because, as I say, we're right up against our time. Um, again, I want to have a huge thank you to our sponsors, BASF, Bear Crab Science, and Syngenta for their support. I want to thank my team that works behind the scenes to make this uh, session come to life. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I will thank our speakers fantastic job, lots of great information that will be available online at seedworld.com within the next 48 hours. And thank you to all of you who have listened. Your attention has been greatly appreciated and your participation today is duly noted. Thank you very much everyone and have a great rest of your day.